Hey everybody, I'm really excited to announce that I'm back with Kendall Darnell from episode 346 of our Tick Bootcamp podcast. Kendall's going to be our co-host today with Mandy Meehan, who is a functional nutritional therapy practitioner, certified dietary supplement professional, and most importantly for this podcast, a certified Lyme specialist. We're going to dig into things about parenting with Lyme, relationships with Lyme, dealing with MCAS, mold exposure, the ups and downs of Lyme, and really the big question all of you want to know, what did Mandy do to get better? And how does she use that experience and now give back to the community in her role as serving others? So first of all, Kendall, welcome back to the co-host uh, to co-host on the Tick Bootcamp podcast. Thank you. It feels like we were just chatting like two weeks ago and it's been almost a year. It's wild. So time flies and Mandy, welcome to our podcast. We're really excited to have you on. Thank you so much. It's so like such an honor to be here and really special because y'all have been a part of my own journey as I was trying to figure out if I had Lyme. I think I, I did find you guys in the early, early days of the podcast. So it's really special to be a part now. Well, I could tell you if Rich were here, he would tell you that he's sorry because we really were bad in the <laughs> beginning and we know we were rough and we won't even listen no. to the early podcast. However, we do have people that go back and listen and give us positive feedback, but we will not do that. So we appreciate you being a listener from early on. <laughs> so, so Mandy, we wanted to talk about, for context, what life was like as a child, where you grew up, and, you know, was this a typical, you know, dream childhood, or were there troubles with your health as well during your early times? For sure. I, I You know, I thought I had a very normal childhood. I did have, a, I had a really great childhood. I danced from the age of three until I graduated. I uh, I mean, by the time I was in high school, I was really like a kind of pre-professional in my dancing. So, you know, many hours a week. So I was very athletic. I was, you know, just living um, a typical, you know, typical active life. Um, but, you know, looking back, it's funny now just with uh, perspective. It's like, oh, it is interesting that I was like, I was a toe walker and, and now I, I see all these connections, you know, to how my health maybe uh, wasn't the best early on. Uh, and, you know, you can kind of connect standard American diet. Did you say or, a toe walker, uh, Mandy? I'm sorry to interrupt. A toe walker. What did yes. that mean, toe walker? I'm like, wait, did I hear that right? I, yeah. yes, yeah. So, yeah, I uh, had to have boot casts when I was five there, there's going to be a certain sect of people that will totally know all like what this is i didn't know it was somewhat of a common thing uh, i had to have boot cast to stretch up my achilles and um it's called, like in the autism community a lot of people walk on their toes um but ba basically now i know there's like a connection to things like heavy metals and toxicity and infections and even like malocclusion you know you're jobbing out of alignment uh and but oh, yeah. you know just the more you learn, the more you're like, wow, all of this is connected. It's not just about that one time I was bit by a tick. <laughs> uh, so, you know, it's like, oh, I, I wasn't, you know, breastfed and then I had antibiotics, you know, you, you kind of make all those connections. And then in high school, um, you know, I, like I said, I was very active living like a normal, what I, you know, live it. I have great family, great life. One of six kids, like family's amazing. Uh, but I did start having issues in high school. I, um, I struggled with dizziness quite a bit. Uh, my, my period started pretty late. I was kind of a late developer. And once it did, it was very irregular. Then it, then I completely like lost my period for a long time. And, and I, I just fell off quite a bit. I didn't know what was wrong. We, we tried to kind of like adjust things. Um, but, but I was still able to live my life the way that I wanted to. Um, and again, like I'm kind of, my life is plain detective now. I'm like, I was living in mold at that point and I had no idea. Uh, and you know, there's so many things involved, but, um, overall, yeah, I definitely did not consider myself chronically ill in the slightest throughout my adolescence. <laughs> and was this in Oklahoma? So, is that where you were? Yes. In Oklahoma. Okay, so for context, like the middle of the United States, basically, right? Yes, right? and there are a lot of ticks. So I, I did get bit by ticks quite a bit growing up. I grew up in the woods. I was constantly in the woods. I, I was homeschooled. Sometimes I would do my school like in the middle of the woods. So, I mean, I certainly was exposed to a lot out there too. 
<laughs> so question, when you are going through and you're, and you're having all these aha moments with the toe walking right. and the jaw out of alignment and all of these, these things, are you saying you're noticing that maybe there is a predisposition or genetics setting you up or you're thinking that maybe things started sooner than you thought? For sure. I would say some aspects are kind of that toxic bucket filling up. Um, from my like perspective, when it comes to my illness, which we'll really get into that, um, you know, like I think a lot of it is the the toxicity really burdening my immune system, keeping me from being able to get the the high load of infections down. Uh, then there are things like the jaw out of alignment. I know that can impact my nervous system. You know, we know not eating a, a healthy diet throughout childhood um, can have negative outcomes. So, um, and honestly, I mean, I know we're kind of getting into so much right now. A number of my family have been um, diagnosed with Lyme at this point. Out of the eight of us, four of us have had it confirmed on testing and the others haven't really looked into it at this point. Uh, so that, you know, begins to raise a lot of questions for me too, of, um, congenital possibly, could, right? I have, could I have even, how early did I really get this? Is there, is it potentially, could it have been passed from my mom? Uh, cause mm -hmm. she is one that has some issues with Lyme. Uh, so, so, you know, some of that is completely unanswered questions, but, uh, there's a lot to, a lot to think about when you're putting the puzzle pieces together. Yes. Yes. But I'm curious, Mandy, did you or your mom, when you were young, know about Lyme and how severe it can be? Was it on your radar? Because you said you were in the woods, you were homeschooled, right? I mean, there are ticks, a lot of ticks where you grew up. Was that on the front of mind for you? Ticks sometimes were on the front of mind. I remember being taught to do tick checks at night, but I didn't really know why that they would be negative other than sucking a little blood. I don't know. Uh, so, so no, I wasn't really aware, um, really at all. And I feel like the first, I remember hearing about Lyme, I was probably 17 or 18. Um, it was like a little short film. Someone mentioned it. And I remember we we're all like, Oh, we thought she was going to have cancer when you're leading up to this illness. Like this isn't, it's, it's like you're sick, but you're not dying. Like we don't really, we don't really get what this is. So mm -hmm. I was not aware. <laughs> What's funny is a, a friend recommended Royal Pains on Netflix, and I guess it's really old. Mm -hmm. So there's the second episode that I watched, and I've been watching it before work. It was just yesterday morning, and they had this whole, it's like Dr. House, if you're not familiar with Royal Pains. There's this doctor, the concierge doctor out in the Hamptons in New York, and his second patient on the second episode was this young child who's 18 years old, this young boy who's getting ready to go play football, uh, he's super elite rich. He's, he has his paralysis, slurring of words, neurological deficits. And in the end, there was a tick biting him, a deer tick specifically on Long Island here mm -hmm. in, in the Hamptons, biting him in his ear, gave him tick paralysis and some other other infections. And, you know, that was the root cause of all these things, right? So it's 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 nice to see that they're using ticks as an example to highlight how bad they can be. And it sounds like that's what you saw, Mandy, when you were 17 as well in a, in a film. For sure. So tell us how this progressed, right? Now you're you're still you're 17, you're having some irregular periods, some dizzy spells, you're getting ready to graduate high school. Do you go to college? Does your health decline? Do you rebound? You know, sometimes we hear people tell us, I got sick, but my immune system, you know, fought back, I got better, and then a year later I got sick again. You know, was what was this like for you in your experience? Right. So yeah, well, I graduated high school at 17 and immediately started interning at my church in our youth ministry. And that um I did that for a while. It continued into, um, I got hired as an associate youth pastor and loved getting to do that. I totally thought that's what I was going to do uh, for the rest of my life. You know, it was like, this is my calling. This is my purpose. And so, so I was in youth ministry, you know, very, um, I mean, intense hours of working at that point. Then, um, and, and yeah, at that, at that point, the, the biggest symptom I had was dizziness. Uh, and, and I would just kind of, uh, run out of steam. I felt like quicker than other people at some points, we would have like a really intense, um, 
week of work doing whatever kind of um, project. And I just remember like I, I would I would feel sick after and same in high school, I would go to camp and I'd always get sick after that like intense week. Mm -hmm. uh, and mm -hmm. I'm always like, man, well, how do people do this so well? Uh, but it really wasn't until uh, um, right, it was right before I got married, I got married at 20, uh, that kind of the perfect storm happened. And I was um, fine, you know, fine enough, you know, active working full time. And then uh, my health completely crashed and wasn't the same since then. So I definitely had that, uh, that big crash moment. Talk to us what, what that was like, right? Because this was five weeks, you said, or weeks before your wedding day. But I, I also think there was more going on, you know, from mm -hmm. talking to you offline and reading your pre-interview questionnaire. I know that you were moving, you were getting a new job, you had a mold yeah. exposure that you didn't know about. I mean, you had a ton of stresses. You were, you know, you, you started a hormonal birth control you talked about, which you think, yeah. you know, messed up your hormones. These are all factors which weakened your immune system uh, in, in your words, allowed all of these infections to not be knocked down. You, you, you said this earlier. So what else was going on in your life at this time that was sort of the perfect storm approach that was going on in your body and in your, your environment? Yes. So yeah, it was um, two weeks before my wedding that I was originally diagnosed with mono. And at the time, that's what we thought it, it, it just was that. But now I'm like, okay, I think... I, th I think th there probably was a lot, a lot um, flaring up all at once. So yes, I um, moved cities, changed jobs, obviously moving cities, planning a wedding, then yeah, started hormonal birth control, which um, I mean, does impair methylation amongst other things. Uh, and so maybe, you know, maybe I wasn't dealing with this, mold, the, you know, then I was exposed to mold in my new workplace and um, yeah, I just got really, really sick. Um, and, you know, I still had a beautiful wedding and honeymoon, even though I was, you know, it was like, it was full blown mono where I was like extra flu -y. but, you know, with mono, typically you expect it to go away in within a few weeks to a couple months. It's you uh -huh. know really fun that really vague about it and to tell you there's nothing that you can do. Um, but, but, you know, my symptoms didn't go away. In fact, they started to get worse and more symptoms kind of, um, came in. So, um, yeah, that's the, the early days. So at this point you had your wedding, you, you pushed through it. I do want to focus on a couple of things, but first, before we get into how things progressed and what doctors you saw, what impact did this have on your relationship? Many people listen to this podcast are in different personal circumstances, but there is a large subset of our right. listeners who are in romantic relationships and struggle because they feel they're not worthy of their partner. They feel their mm -hmm. partner doesn't understand. They have communication issues. And that's a really important topic that not everybody's comfortable speaking about, but we get questions privately all the time about either A, entering new relationships, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. am I ready to have a relationship at, you know, after Lyme or during Lyme, or B, I'm in a relationship, but I'm looking for some guidance because I'm not sure I can make this work. So can you speak to the impact it had on your, your personal romantic relationship with your now husband at this time when you first got mono and then realized it wasn't going away and that just turned into a long-term health issue for you? For sure. I told you I'm definitely going to cry. I'm already tearing up thinking about this because mm -hmm. I do think it is for me now um, one of the most, um, like a very difficult part of, uh, part of the, the Lyme journey for me is, um, not being able to, you know, serve my husband the way that I want to, um, you know, and I uh, be the, 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 you know, even the, do all the things I want to as a mom now, or, um, taking care of my home. So, um, uh, yeah, I totally get that. There's so many, um, aspects that, um, and, and like you said, communication and relationship and your, you know, um, partner, husband, um, un understanding kind of what's going on too. So I'm so fortunate. My husband is, I mean, I, I just think he's the greatest human ever. Um, he has been incredibly supportive, you know, the entire time and literally like not in almost eight years of marriage has ever, um, complained about how, um, how my health has impacted things. Um, and right now, you know, we'll get to this. I'm pregnant right now. I'm like, here, he literally is doing, you know, doing everything for me and my, 
my son, which is, um, uh, it's a lot, but, um, so, so I'm so fortunate that, uh, really like, because my health crashing was so dramatic. Um, I mean, everybody believed me. It was like, she was, you know, she was dancing, she was working out, like getting up at 6 AM every morning before. And, uh, you know, like I, people joke that I, um, you know, we kind of pass this a little bit, but like when I was working, they're like, she never rests. She has time off. And she, like I'd have time off at our church and I would go visit another church. Like it was kind of ridiculous. <laughs> I didn't know how to rest. Uh, <laughs> uh, so, so yeah, whenever I did get married, um, and, and, you know, here I am, like, I want to be, you know, have all these expectations of myself as a wife here. I have this, this new job I'm working in. Um, and I, I'm like, can barely take care of myself. Um, let alone, um, I mean, uh, after six months of trying and taking time off and trying to heal and, um, I had to step away from, uh, step away from my job and stop working. Um, so, so yeah, just, I mean, in the early days, it was, uh, definitely, you know, very difficult on, on, on me <laughs> for sure. Um, but I'm so fortunate. My husband's been so supportive. And then even today, like just last week, I had a little, like, need to process like, oh, you know, I've never been able to like clean the house for you, husband. Mm. Um, like you do it all. Um, and uh, anyway, he's, you know, like I said, he's amazing. He's like, I'd, you know, much rather have this with you than, um, man, than that with someone else. So um, I'll get myself yeah. together in a minute. No, look, this As is. You can tell, like, he's amazing. <laughs> Thank you, Mandy, for being so that, honest. That, that was going to be my question: was what specifically do you feel like you are missing out on, and that you would like to do that if you didn't have wine, you would be doing? And so, cleaning the house yeah. sounds like one. <laughs> is there another example? Yeah, there's been moments in my healing journey where, um, you know, you get excited about a treatment and you kind of imagine like, what am I going to do once this all kind of comes together? Mm -hmm. uh, and it's funny, like usually cleaning my house or like organizing is one that I get really excited about just because it, you know, it's been something I haven't been able to do in a while, but yeah, because I guess, you know, we haven't really gotten to like, what is line like for me? And, you know, my, uh, I kind of counted earlier, like my 21 plus infections, you know, known infections at this point. Um, so, I mean, I, I do have, um, you know, the severe exercise intolerance, just basically exertion intolerance. Uh, so that does keep me, you know, from, um, being, you know, as active as I would like, I mean, it keeps me from being active period for sure. Um, and being able to do things around the house, being able to, you know, work, uh, full time. Um, and so, so, you know, there's obviously a lot of, um, a lot of grief there and things that um mm -hmm. can you know be difficult to process as you're working towards healing knowing that healing is possible too um so so yeah there's you know plenty of things in there that are the um yeah the the things that you're really looking forward to in healing um but uh, really briefly since i and i know we're skipping we're kind of jumping around a lot but <laughs> since I've been pregnant again for the second time, um, I really started to, I'm like, you know, I totally, I'm, I 1000% I'm healing. I've come so far. I'm really so much better than I I've been. And I've learned so much and I'm, you know, getting there, but you know, now I'm pr pregnant. So I can't really work on treatment as much as I was before. It's like, I'm embracing the, some of the aspects of disability, like, um, more than I ever had before. And that's like something I kind of, um, uh, kind of like stayed away from for a little bit. And now I'm like, no, this is empowering. Like we're buying the wheelchair and I'm going on like long walks with my husband and son. Um, anyway, I haven't really talked about that publicly before okay. yet. But... So Mandy, the fact that you're going on long walks with your husband and son and the fact that you have a son and now you're having another child right. in the wheelchair, a, but yes, <laughs> but just being a mom alone is physically taxing on your body. Right. And frankly, Absolutely. many people in this community, myself included, you know, when we are at our worst can't be, you know, a dad or a mom. Right. So you it's, you've clearly made progress and we're going to kind of outline that. Right. You know, we're talking about how you first got sick and you had this crash, but here you are today, a mom uh, about to be another, uh, you know, a new mom again, a second time. 
married and making more and more progress. So we're going to circle back right. to the whole, the whole, you know, husband and wife discussion. We're going to circle back to the mom discussion because it's a really important discussion to have. But I want to make sure that we kind of go through your, uh, your, your journey as well because here you are. You're, you're married. You think you have, you have mono and it's going to go away, but it doesn't. And you're getting sicker and sicker and sicker. So what do you do next? And I know for you, it was about a six year journey. So you're 20 years old, you're sick. You don't get diagnosed till you're 26. Walk us through the period of when you were 20 to 26 and what this journey of doctors looked like before you finally got a diagnosis. For sure. So yeah, six months into getting sick, I have to step away from my job. Very, very traumatic. Cause I'm like, I don't, what's going on? Like, am I dying? You know, and I, mm -hmm. I'm like losing my purpose. And um, I'm like, you know, am I going to have to be just a, um, just sick wife at home. So right whenever um, that moment happened, I knew things had to change um, and had to change drastically. So like a lot of things in my life immediately changed at once. Um, for one, um, my, my diet completely changed. I was actually just doing a short term, um, like a spiritual fast, doing like a kind of plant-based diet at that point. Uh, so I step away from my job. I talked to my father-in-law as a medical doctor. He is actually um, a functional medicine doctor, which is cool. I didn't know that when we got married. <laughs> uh, and he's amazing. Uh, and so he said, like, stop the plant-based diet. He like sent me the bulletproof diet from Dave Asprey. So I read that and I'm like, okay, I'm like getting excited about nutrition. And, um, and then I know I have to find some way to um, still have purpose in my life. And I didn't know what that was going to be, but really pretty quickly, um, I felt like I was supposed to start sharing my journey on YouTube when, um, at, up until that point, I was an incredibly private person, um, not vulnerable, not transparent. Y'all were asking earlier, is anything off limits to talk about? I'm like, nothing. I mean, younger me would never say that. I'm like, I don't, I don't talk about uh, anything that personal or private. Um, but suddenly I'm like, okay, if I'm going to find a way to help people, I'm going to have to start sharing about the hard stuff because it's all really hard right now. So, um, so it's kind of, you know, I don't do YouTube at this point right now, but YouTube was a big part of my journey because that's how I found the chronic illness world. I didn't know really it was chronic illness and autoimmunity. I didn't really know that was a thing, let alone that there are so many people out there let alone that it was such a like a depressing and often hopeless community. And I just, from the beginning, I'm like, I just don't believe that my body just breaks. I 1000% believe that healing is possible um, and is out there. And it's just a matter of finding it. Um, and it was, it's funny in the beginning, a lot of people are like, check for Lyme, check for mold. And I'm like, that doesn't make any sense. I have mono. <laughs> and then people are like, your immune system. I'm like, this isn't even an immune system issue anymore. And now I'm like, what was I thinking? Uh, it's so funny. So because we did think it was just mono, I was just kind of waiting for it to fade away for a long time. And then was using diet and, and supplements. I mean, totally piecemealing things together myself thinking that would kind of work things out. After a year, when things weren't getting better, my family, obviously, they were really concerned um, and they shipped me off to the Mayo Clinic. Um, that sounds kind of, <laughs> uh, I don't know. Sounds kind of- Shipped you off. Shipped me off. I obviously was willing to go. Uh, and at Mayo, I was diagnosed with chronic fatigue syndrome and fibromyalgia. Um, I didn't go through actually every appointment they had scheduled for me there because um, I was supposed to go in two rounds. But after the diagnosis, I'm like, okay, this feels good to kind of have a label. People can kind of know a bit more how serious this is. But I knew that that didn't really mean um, anything that was really going to help me yet. <laughs> uh, mm -hmm. That it was just kind of an umbrella term for a, a group of symptoms. Um so, so, I mean, I was grateful to rule things out there that, you know, people can, um, my, my family can feel better that, um, that I don't have like a terminal illness or something, but, um, but yeah, it, it, there was just kind of a long period of time where I did things like that. Um, I actually, probably the next thing after Mayo, I found DNRS and started really working on nervous system regulation, um, for people who aren't familiar. Hey Mandy, can I, I'm sorry to interrupt. Am. Before you go with the NRS, can I ask, no. did the Mayo Clinic test you for Lyme or did they think about Lyme or any tick-borne illness while you were there? I don't believe so. Um, 
Yeah, I and I, I doubt it. Um, I don't know if yeah. you're not the first person or, who's had a bad experience there. So I, I'm just asking because right. it, it's funny because people are like, oh yeah, they're 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 gonna say they're gonna save me. And it's like, yeah, you know, they gave me a name for my symptoms, right? It's exactly what you're saying. Right. But uh, before you get to DNRS, you it seemed like you you're very natural minded. You said because of the so mana, you were doing supplements and you were doing a lot of things like diet and you know, sleep. So is this how you were even when you were healthy as a child? Is this something that your family sort of put into you to be more natural minded than, you know, drug minded or, or pharmaceutical right. minded? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, for sure, my mom, she would give us essential oils instead of um, instead of medications when we would be sick. She'd, you know, kind of do her own little um uh, you know, raindrop therapy on our back if we were sick, putting all the different mm. oils on and she would try to give us more organic. And I think, um, uh, in general, like that helped a bit, but I also just kind of think naturally tend that way a little bit. Um, and we actually, yeah, we did some like bioresonance testing in high school. My mom, I think was, she's just always been very open-minded. What, <laughs> what, what, what is this? Bioresonance Bio testing. Yes. So it's like basically a frequency test. This one that we did, you put your hand on a little scanner and it measures like the frequencies in your hand and it tested against frequencies of um, food and nutri you know, nutrition and like, are you sensitive to these foods? Are you needing these nutrients? Um, I occasionally use bioresonance testing in my practice now. Um, I'm using like hair and saliva instead of like the little hand thing. So, and so we would get supplements after that. Um, so, so, I mean, I didn't really understand much of that, but, um, and, and, you know, uh, yeah, even my mom, she's like, oh, you know, there's so much that I would have done differently now. And, um, you know, she's learned a lot in the natural world as well. But so, yeah, I was um, familiar. And then on the nutrition side, um, when I was working full-time in youth ministry and I wasn't having my period, I thought this really isn't, um, doesn't seem healthy. When I went to the OB, they just offered birth control. Um, and this is, you know, before I was about to get married, I didn't, um, didn't need birth control. Uh, and, and I'm like, that doesn't make any sense at all. I'm like, I'm going to try something else. And I like was Googling and something suggested going gluten-free. I went gluten-free and my period started back literally within one or two days of cutting out gluten. Wow. It was like very, wow. very quickly. Um, and there were kind of multiple times as I'm experimenting before I got sick, I'm like, okay, yeah, nutrition's a pretty big deal. So I kind of had, you know, some primer there where I knew it would be, pretty important. And even when I was in middle school, I remember like loving my nutrition book and I'm like, Oh, it says drink milk with every meal. And my mom's like, this is actually a little outdated. Like maybe don't do that. <laughs> but, uh, so, I mean, I think, you know, there's that natural fascination that has just been, you know, coming out for my, you know, my purpose now slowly coming to the surface. So I, I interrupted you. I apologize. You were talking about dynamic neural retraining system, the DNRS, which is the brain rewiring. And it sounds like you probably found that from your fibromyalgia and chronic fatigue syndrome diagnosis, stumbled upon that and yes. you gave it a shot, right, Mandy? So I'm sorry, if you can pick back up with that, please. Yes, very good. Yeah. And the, there are a period of a couple of years where it's like, I tried so much, but also such random things, you know, I don't want to spend forever on it, but, you know, I do think that the nervous system, um, you know, rewiring neuroplasticity programs can be so instrumental. That was when I, I, I did the six month program very diligently. It's like an hour a day of their, their um, practice for six months. Um, and that was the first time I really ever did see real progress in my health. I saw a real shift. Um, now, you know, unfortunately it wasn't um, what needed to take me um, all the way there, but um, I really felt like I was kind of on the right track with um, some, you know, focusing on the neurological side. Um, and to some extent, I, I think that's really important. But um, yeah, after that, I did, um, I like traveled to another state to do like a scalp acupuncture that I was convinced was really going to help me. It was like this really cool neurofocus acupuncture. I mean, we saw people getting out of uh, wheelchairs when we were there. 
really incredible acupuncturist, but, and I felt some relief when I was there. I was like, wow, I feel like lighter on my feet, but um, actually like really crash after kind of was a bit of a like whole traumatic, uh, truly <laughs> interestingly traumatic experience uh, that I don't think we have enough time to get into all of that, but it was at that point where I was like, okay, I've been aware of functional medicine this whole time. And I've just kind of thought I can get away with not paying for it. Uh, <laughs> but it's to actually see like a naturopath or functional medicine doctor. And, you know, I had seen a couple conventional doctors and I went to Mayo. So I kind of, I did that thing a bit, but like, it's time to really try to have someone actually look at Lyme, actually look at mold, all these mm-hmm. things that people keep saying. And I just didn't really think was a part of the picture for me. So you went to a, I mean, really, I don't know that you really needed to, because it sounds like you knew all the stuff that they were going to do anyway. You just couldn't test your own blood. But if you, if you could test your own, your own blood, I don't think you needed a doctor at this point, Mandy, but tell us about the doctor you saw. And, and if, you know, if you did get a blood test for Lyme and co-infections and what the results were, I think yours is sort of an interesting story mm-hmm. in that regard. Right. It, it is funny because uh, cause I, I was such a researcher from the beginning. I mean, I was reading, like I said, I started with like Dave Asprey Bulletproof, but then I was going through every book that I could, every podcast that I could. And I'm like sharing all this on YouTube. People are starting to kind of look to me as someone with knowledge. Um, and, and when I did see this functional practitioner, he was a bit impressed with how much I knew. It's funny. Like I knew a lot of certain things, but then I just didn't I didn't know how to apply them correctly or the right order was missing really, Mm -hmm. really big things. Um, so yeah. So you asked about like the testing that I first did. Sorry. Was that your, your question? So yeah, I did, um, a lot of tests with this functional practitioner. And yeah, it was funny. We tested really like at first we didn't get a lot of helpful answers because we tested for mold. My, my markers were zero all the way down, like completely zero to the point where he's like, everybody has a little bit of mold on here. Like this, this is not accurate. Uh, you, you have like, you know, a little bit from whatever peanut butter you're eating or something coming out typically. Um, and then I don't know if I did right away, but I did, um, I think it was Igenix Lyme test and, um, and that came back negative. So, um, there was actually one of the markers was, Um, kind of, I can't even remember at this point, it wasn't negative. It wasn't positive. It was that in between thing. Um, something. Yes. Yeah. And we didn't really quite know what to do with it. And so we kind of were like, okay, it looks like no, but we'll keep it in the back of our mind. Um, I did do a toxicity test that, you know, tested metals, um, and environmental toxins. And that showed really, um, high toxicity levels from, um, all kinds of things from glyphosate to just like different VOCs and, you know, BPA or whatever you name it. Um, so, so we at least knew, okay, let's start working on toxicity. And that's really what I did, um, for a long time was just focus on detoxification. Mandy, Um, can you, can you explain, so, you know, use a couple of words there, like VOCs and, you know, terms like that. And, And a lot of these things, I right. feel, you know, are are due to modern society. You know, you go back, we had Dr. Jill Carnahan on the podcast. We talked about growing up on a farm. And, you know, when they introduced, you know, the, the mainstream use of these pesticides, her health got even worse. And how not only that, but, you know, using these pesticides and growing food, you know, has a huge impact on our health. And, you know, what that really means for people that are listening to this podcast, you know, BPAs, microplastics, and what that means, you know, for, for toxicity and, and, you know, weakening our immune system. What what all of these chemicals that are now in our environment that weren't before mean for us? Because I think it's important to note, you know, these things, especially because the rate of chronic illness and the rate of these, you know, these inflammatory conditions are at an all-time high in our world today. And I think a lot of us are on the cusp of having these illnesses but because of the increased toxins in our world, we're just seeing chronic illness skyrocket. And that's a really hard concept to grasp, but obviously you have a good grasp of what these things are. So, you know, VOCs, you know, Volgan, uh, uh, help me out the, the acronym here, organic compounds, oh, volatile organic compounds, organic right? Compounds, yeah. <laughs> yes. Can you just give us a little bit of idea of what those things are and how they impact our day-to-day health when we consume plastics, when we consume these VOCs, like, you know, off-gassing from a mattress, for example, and how that can be harmful to our health and things right. like that. 
Absolutely. Yeah, no, the mattress one, we just upgraded to a king bed, which is so exciting, you know, as we're growing our family, like we need room to snuggle both of our baby and toddler coming up. Uh, and, and I'm like, okay, I have to buy the non-toxic bed, the non-toxic mattress, the non-toxic sheets, and it's worth it. But man, big investment up front, but, but it's great because I didn't have a headache whenever it came in. Um, but yes, yeah, there's so much in the environment that when you totally can have such a big impact on our health. Um, a lot of it really impacts our mitochondria, you know, the powerhouse of the cell, which is, you know, really to me, so foundational, not just like for energy, but for our immune system. Um, a lot of people know that some of these, um, uh, chemicals or, um, especially like plastics and things you'd find like in makeup products can really impact our hormones. Um, you know, they can be estrogenic or they can suppress progesterone. Um, and, and obviously like mycotoxins, a lot of people are aware of that can impact the immune system or, um, you know, the respiratory system. It really, you know, um, it's, you know, not ideal it can, I, in my mind, like it can impact every single system. And when, um, you know, you're not draining, you're not detoxifying properly, which that's something I didn't mention from childhood. I was constipated my entire childhood. Like literally I didn't know what normal was. Um, and you know, you might not even be eating, you know, well enough to give your liver the fuel that it needs. And, um, you know, a combination of all these things, like you said, I think really do set so many of us up, unfortunately, um, to be sick and to have symptoms. And we do, see it everywhere. When I see someone who seems really, really healthy now, I'm like, what is this? Like everyone, everyone's um, somewhat <laughs> sick right now, unfortunately, but. So uh, apologies for the interruption, but I think I just wanted to highlight that, you know, the, all of these things collectively contribute to the increase in chronic illness and they collectively, they compromise you as a whole in your body and make you more susceptible to these low grade infections like Lyme disease. And by saying low, it's a low grade right. infection, it doesn't mean that it's not a severe illness. It just means that it's it's in many cases isn't going to kill you. And I'm not saying it won't kill you because I know there's a lot of stories out there. You know that that in, in extreme cases it can. However, it sort of right. just results in in this chronic state of of suffering if we don't address it. But it is something to your point, Mandy, that we can continue to work towards and we can feel better. We can strengthen our immune systems. We can use Western and Eastern modalities to reduce the pathogenic load in our bodies and to, you know, bolster our immune system, to bolster our nervous system. And to, in many cases, we can retrain our brain because our, our neural pathways do become altered from chronic illness. And you touched on that with DNRS, right? And all these tools will, you know, will help us, you know, find a state of, of better health. So I just wanted to highlight that piece. But what I find really interesting is that Igenix for you, which is the premier lab that everybody always talks about, mm -hmm. didn't mm -hmm. flag your Lyme and you went to Vibrant, which then said, you know, ding, 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 Lyme disease, right? And that's kind of what you were touching on before I uh, interrupted. So can you share with us how that worked out with your, I think your naturopath was Rob Wilson, right? You said, and, and uh, what your plan was once you realized you had Lyme disease. Uh, sorry, ask the question again, what, what I did, the plan after it was yeah, negative. Well, uh, well, once you got your diagnosis, cause it sounds like you got your negative test from Igenix, yes. you then ran through vibrant labs because you had such, you know, yes. consistent symptoms of Lyme disease and, you know, being natural minded, having a naturopath, you knew that yes. the testing wasn't perfect. You got a positive test. Were there other co-infections you were looking for? If so, what were they that tested mm -hmm. positive and what was your treatment plan from that point forward? Okay, perfect. Yes. Yeah. So unfortunately there was a good gap here. So I was kind of making sure like, okay, am I going to skip ahead to when I did get that positive? So yeah, after a period of time, I kind of, we did really start to assume, okay, there probably is Lyme there. And then I got pregnant with my first son. So I was really focused on that. It was actually three months postpartum with my son. I got bit by a tick again. And Ugh. then a month after that, um, developed joint pain for the first time and said, mm. and really no other symptoms other than the joint pain. But I'm like, if I didn't have Lyme before, I definitely have it now, or at least, you know, some new infections kind of added to the list. So, um, you know, at this point, um, I'm a practitioner myself in the, in the journey. Um, and, uh, yeah, it's like so many months postpartum with my son and I decided to finally like, okay, I'm going to do this vibrant test. They test a lot more markers than Igenix. And, um, and I just really, real, I really just have to know. Um, so yeah, no, I, I actually like wrote everything down today. Um, and that test, yeah, I've got like, 
uh, seven or six types of Borrelia, a Babesia, Bartonella, Anaplasma, Coxsackie virus, Cytomegalovirus, Epstein-Barr virus, of course, um, Toxoplasma gondii, which is a very interesting one, you know, a number of the viruses in the herpes family, like Epstein-Barr's herpes family, HSV6. Um, then actually, it was on, later on bioresonance, we mentioned that that it flagged um, a few markers that aren't on vibrant, um, Ehrlichia sinetsu, uh, and, and then two forms of mycoplasma that aren't on vibrant. So um, yeah, it's amazing. Even with that crazy test that tests so many markers, you may still be missing some, uh, but was there anything yeah, you didn't so have, I, or was it just positive, positive, positive? Po it sounds like yeah, you, <laughs> you know, in the end, it, it unfortunately had you had a lot of things going on right. in your body, and no wonder why you were so sick. And again, I feel like if you had one, your body might be able to fight it off, but the collectively, okay. it's the combination of all of these things which just shuts down your body and makes your immune system go haywire and creates inflammation and creates pain and creates neurological symptoms, right? It's just that's that right trigger effect of all these pathogens in your body. So I'm, I'm leaning more and more towards you had congenital Lyme and you picked up a ton of stuff after birth. You picked up a ton of stuff during birth. And as you went on and had stressors, mold exposure, all of mm -hmm. these, you know, these things going on, it just, it just dogpiled on your body. Mm -hmm. Right. No, I totally, yeah, would not be surprised if that were the case. Um, so once I got those results, um, I started um, really for the first time ever targeting those infections, actually using homeopathy. Um, some people might be familiar with Desbio is an incredible company that they really specialize a lot, um, work, especially as working with Lyme and co-infections quite a bit. Um, and they have um, really, um, I think, are incredible protocols to help uh, train your immune system to bring, like, be able to um, bring those pathogens back into balance. And I, you know, like legally, I'm sure if you're representing the supplement company, you really shouldn't say that's really more for symptom relief. Um, but um, that was really, and, and I was still breastfeeding too. So I wasn't really um, able to do crazy herbals or antibiotics, but um, yeah, that was really the the path that I took and was taking to um, finally address those infections. Um, and then I got, you know, a blessing surprise pregnancy. So got things on pause a little <laughs> bit, but um, it's cool, you know, um, I work with clients with Lyme and um, and I utilize homeopathy and herbals, um, both in combination or at different times. And um, yeah, I mean, it's kind of funny, you know, I'm still so much in the journey, but working with people, I'm like, I, I, I mean, I see people healing every single day and I've been able to help people make incredible progress in their health, which is so, so cool. Even before I was a practitioner, people were like, oh, I found DNRS because of you and I'm like, heal now. And I'm like, I mean, amazing. Uh, you know, it's like so such a blessing to help people. But you're like, then also you're like, oh man, I like, I can't wait to be better too. Um, but Mindy, did you say but that yeah, you, that's you got pregnant after Desbio? Is that what you were saying? So you started Desbio and shortly after you got pregnant. <laughs> yes. Uh, so I mean, I was doing it for like because I have a lot of infections. I was working through a lot of their kits to, um, you know, kind of go after different infections. Um, and I was towards the end of some, I, I kind of just kept, because I had so many kept adding things in. I, I've learned, you know, you learn so much about how to do things even more effectively in the process. But, um, but yeah, then I got pregnant last August and I, and I was spending, you know, it was almost a year, maybe working through some of the kits. Um, yeah. You know, you know, it's interesting. But so yeah, that's the more I was wanting to do. <laughs> I, I, yeah, the reason I'm asking the question is so, you know, Desbio, we, we've, it's been on our radar for quite a while. Desbio, the company reached right. out a little over a year ago and asked us to have some of their doctors on because, you know, to be honest, we didn't have enough Desbio practitioners on. We've had a lot of doctors. We had several. The right. one that I, that I liked the most was Dr. Shannon White, who, you know, was a Desbio practitioner mm, yeah, she's and great. she was awesome. But, you know, you know, to be honest about our our patient experience on this podcast some of them are like it actually made me feel worse because i flared and i never got any better mm -hmm. and some of them right. are like hey it did nothing for me and some of them like it was the game changer that i needed to get into remission right so it's such a spectrum of like it flared me up to sure. it cured me right the on the other extreme but i wonder you know if, if your body I, I you know i'm a believer of if your nervous system is extremely dysregulated and your body is that unwell 
it's going to be harder for your body to get pregnant. So the fact that you're, you're on Desbio and it's balancing out your hormones, it's balancing out your regulating your immune system. Do you think that it, you know, Desbio was in part responsible for your ability to get pregnant even, right? Because a lot of people that are really sick with Lyme mm -hmm. that try to get pregnant, in many cases can't. For sure. Yeah. I mean, that definitely has been a huge part of my story. Obviously, earlier on, I mentioned the hormonal dysregulation I had in high school and um, post birth control pill. I was actually relying on bioidentical hormones up until I got pregnant with my first son. Uh, so then um, it was, you know, a year or so postpartum getting back my cycle and having a regular cycle on my own without the use of, um, um, you know, exogenous hormones, uh, you know, bioidentical hormones like that I was putting on myself. Um, it was like, you know, there's been so many huge wins like that in the process. I mean, to like getting pregnant and having, um, I, I told y'all earlier, I was able to have a home birth, which to me was such a faith step because I'm like, I, I don't have the ability to exercise. How am I supposed to do like this crazy hardest physical feat? And I knew one person with the chronic fatigue syndrome kind of illness that had done it. And I'm like, that's enough for me. Like we're going to try. <laughs> and my, my midwife, she's like, people give birth in comas, like your body can do it. <laughs> and obviously, you know, you have all your plans. You make sure that, that you're um, cleared for all of the other different reasons. But um, yeah, I, it's been and so many blessings and, and miracles and, you know, steps of progress. Um, and yeah, like through does bio, I mean, it, like you said, there, there can be a lot of ups and downs for people. It can take a long time. Like, you know, for me, I went through a lot of kits for about a year and I knew I had a lot more work to do. I've worked with clients also who um, had a lot of infections show up on vibrant. She's on kits for, you know, for uh, does bio kits for like four or five months. And she's like, I felt like I was dying. And now I feel like I'm thriving, you know, sometimes it can be quick and some, you know, it just really, really depends. And there's so many layers and there's no one thing or one quick fix. But um, yeah, before I got pregnant, I definitely was starting to see that like increase in stamina, that regularity and um, hormonal balance, those good things you want to see. Um, and yeah, I felt, I, you know, we were, I was wanting to grow our family. We were, I was hoping to be, um, you know, in remission, I was hoping to be um, much further along in my journey or to, you know, see more progress before getting pregnant. But um, I really wasn't, um, I, I don't know, I wasn't worried about it because I knew my body could do it. I could support my well, myself well through it. And I've done a lot to set myself up for success um, in that process. You, I didn't mention this. You, you go ahead and I can go back to it. There's oh, so much. I, I'm just, I'm so curious. I mean, you, you touch on so many things that I've, the wheels are just spinning like crazy in my mind. Um, have you noticed, you know, typically there's a difference between um, pregnancies with each subsequent child, right? Have you noticed sure. any changes from the first one to the second one um, yes. of of Lyme and like how that played a factor? Did you, have you been able to pinpoint what's Lyme and what's just normal pregnancy? Yeah, that's a good question. So my first pregnancy, um, I was, you know, when I, when we, we were choosing to try to get pregnant at, at that point, and honestly, to some extent, it's like some people feel a lot better in pregnancy. We mm -hmm. want to grow a family and maybe this will also be helpful. And, um, at that, in that pregnancy, I didn't feel better, but I also didn't feel worse. Um, so I was grateful that it was about the same for me, except for, I mean, I did have pretty intense first trimester morning sickness or all day sickness. Um, mm. but overall it was really pretty smooth. Um, and, and I just felt so blessed because I wasn't sure, can I get pregnant? Can I sustain a pregnancy? Mm -hmm. Is this even wise? Um, do you think that so, the hormones that you were taking prior um, might have eased you into not noticing like these big wild swings or anything because your hormones were regulated going into pregnancy? Uh, that's a good question. You know, I, I do so much to try to support symptoms, to support hormone balance. I mean, you know, like I did use like progesterone in my first trim trimester because I no, I tend towards low progesterone and, um, and, you know, tested also. And so, you know, there are things like that, that, um, 
and do to help support. So second pregnancy current, you know, I'm currently 30 weeks pregnant in my third trimester getting so close. I'm so excited. <laughs> um, this pregnancy has been a very, very difficult. Um, and, and it's interesting, you know, I kind of, uh, when you, you know, you, I kind of look, so I look in the chronic fatigue syndrome world, um, pretty often because that's like my type of Lyme, you know, Lyme can present in so many ways. I'm the, right. the poster child of the CFS ME kind of, um, thing. So it, it, when you kind of read from like, they like typically people with chronic fatigue syndrome, they do have successful pregnancies. They do miscarry a little bit more often. Um, but typically their pregnancies do get worse over time. Um, if you have multiple pregnancies, um, and so, and it's interesting, I've talked to a number of women who've experienced this and, um, and I basically for a while, I'm like, I don't really know what's going on in this pregnancy in the second trimester. Um, there's some really intense symptoms where I just kind of basically would feel like I'm just going to like collapse at any moment. Um, mm -hmm. really just like, uh, I mean, like very, just very, very low functioning where it's like, I would like have to like lay down in the middle of like making my breakfast. Cause I'm like, I'm going to fall over. I'm going to pass mm -hmm. out. Um, I would feel like I'd almost get like narcoleptic. Like, like I felt mm -hmm. like I needed to be narcoleptic. Like I needed to just fall asleep at any moment. Uh, and then I'd have like crazy heart palpitations and things like that. So basically I finally made the connection. This is, um, I, this is very mast cell activation. This is very histamine intolerance. Um, I mean, and once I yeah. figured that out, um, man, life has been so much better in these last few, few weeks, a month or so. Um, I've been really working on stabilizing mast cells, um, mi unfortunately minimizing histamine foods, which is unfortunately, cause it's really not fun. <laughs> and so many foods mm -hmm. are high in histamine but um, it's made pregnancy so much more manageable for me. And again, I've talked to a number of women who've experienced so many girls. I posted about this the other day and all these girls were messaging me saying I had the exact same experience in pregnancy. And, you know, all I was told was just to take more iron or vitamin D or mm -hmm. whatever. And I just like suffered through so much um, until the end. And um, I mean, I'm so grateful that I have things that can help me manage um, and then I do think there's probably a connection just with the estrogen, um, you know, the estrogen being so high in pregnancy, shifting um, some of us into more of a mast cell state. I don't know exactly what's happening there. I do not understand thoroughly how the immune system changes in pregnancy. You know, it's such an interesting time. Mm -hmm. But um, so, yeah, this this time has been harder for me, but man, now I'm like, I'm so excited because it's getting better. And then I've learned so much, uh, mm -hmm. that's like learned so many things that I can safely do during pregnancy. That's made it better. And I'm like, I can share this with people and they can have better pregnancies now, uh, which, you know, like is what? Such a, um, blessing. Uh, like I mean, what? like with, yeah, like with the mast cell symptoms, um, you know, I've got like a few supplements that I use, things like stinging nettle extract or perilla, which, you know, it's like tough to find those pregnancy safe things. Um, mm -hmm. you know, I, no, I kind of know my triggers and things to avoid and more and more you, and it's tough when you realize more and more like, oh yeah, I'm reacting to that food too. Um, but then some, you know, if you know, it's going to be high histamine food, you know, you take your Dow enzyme before to help break it down. Um, and, yeah. So, I mean, like all the shifts like that. And my husband is like, man, this is like, uh, we're both kind of realizing, um, I mean, I've, I've just been so much more, more functional in the last, um, the last month or so since I've, I've realized that. And, um, and yeah, since I've, that, yeah, I've, I've been thrown so many things to kind of like help the immune system, some medicinal mushrooms, uh, chrysanthemum is an interesting herb that has some anti-Lyme properties that's actually really safe in pregnancy. Um, I've actually started neurofeedback in pregnancy. I've only done three sessions so far, but um, again, going back to the brain, um, that's something I'm still still working on and I'm excited to to get through um, get Mandy, through that have treatment. You, have you seen um, Primal Trust? Have you looked into Primal Trust? 
you know, you have DNRS, yeah, you have I've the got the program. Yes, I haven't, um, I haven't done that one, but I've been hearing so many great things. Um, I actually have been doing a little bit of Gupta recently because they actually like, have been giving away trials to practitioners so they can be familiar for their clients. So I've been testing some of that one out. Um, some people are familiar with Sarah Jackson. We became close friends actually through DNRS. We were like the only people sharing DNRS six years ago or whatever. And now she has a really awesome nervous system program. I've done some of hers. Um, but I hear so many great things about primal trust and um, I'm really intrigued to look into it more because, um, yeah, I mean, you should reach out to her. We, we've had primal. So we, Kathleen King is the founder of primal trust and we've had, right. you know, most of the, the, the big players on from a brain retraining standpoint. And I'll tell you, she blew me away. I mean, super smart, right. super brilliant. And, you know, I highly recommend you reach out to her, you know, especially from a practitioner to practitioner standpoint, but I also think personally as well, she has a really good program, really, really like Primal Trust. That's what I hear. Yeah, I'll definitely have to do that. So, I mean, you're doing all kinds of cool stuff, right? So I want to, mm -hmm. I think we're, we're going to circle back to the MCAS stuff and the pregnancy because I have more questions for you right. on that. And I think Kendall does too, right. but yeah. I just, I, I want to figure out where you were. So you were doing... You were doing all that is bio herbs and you know homeopathy. You got pregnant. You right. had to take a break. You had your first son, right? Jace, I believe, is your son's name. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. So you're and you're married to James. James is your husband, right? Yes. Okay. So you know then then before we get into what it was like after that first pregnancy, I want to ask you how what tips do you have for our listeners when it comes to a relationship because you got sick mm -hmm. right before you got married. Here you are, you know, years later and you're having a child and you have a very strong relationship with your husband. And I know, you you know, I'm, I I know he's an amazing man. Right. But there mm -hmm. are things that you both have done to result in having a successful relationship despite your illness. So what are those things that you've done to help overcome the hurdles of your illness and impacting, you know, you to be successful? Because I think a lot of people are curious to know what you've done to be successful, tips, tricks and just feedback for the community dealing with Lyme and trying to make a, a romantic relationship work? Mm -hmm. Right. That's such a good question. And it, it's kind of hard for me to process through, like, what are those things? Kind of my first instinct is really, I think it's, it is the same, the same steps that anybody should take to have a really healthy marriage. Um, I mean, we talk about all the time, you know, first year of marriage is a often people say, oh, it's really difficult because you're really adjusting. Like I was so sick, but it was still like the, the best year ever because I was married to my best friend and we were able to just um, still enjoy each other, even though I was very sick. Um, so I, I, yeah, I really do think it's um, a lot of, a lot of things I would say to anybody who's married that it's not 50, 50, it's 100%, 100%. Um, and, and 100% <laughs> is is not always, you know, it might not be what you um, want it to be. I love this book called Take the Stairs uh, about like doing the hard ride over the easy wrong. And when I first got sick, my I'm like, oh, I have to take the elevator or the escalator. I'm like, I just really, I was like, take the stairs. I love the Take the Stairs book. My husband's like, <laughs> taking the escalator for you is taking the stairs. <laughs> like, oh. You know, sometimes, uh, you know, resting and taking care of yourself is the right thing to be able to, mm -hmm. um, you know, that is me um, doing the best that I can to be able to love my family well and to, um, uh, you know, get to uh, get to serve in the way that I'm able to. So, um, yeah, I think uh, with, you know, I, I work with and talk to, I mean, I don't, I've probably talked to thousands of people with chronic illness just through YouTube and now working with clients and social media and all of that. Um, and it really does break my heart how often I do hear husbands, um, and you know, it can be wives too, but I, I mostly talk to women <laughs> of struggling with, um, understanding, mm -hmm. um, understanding their spouse's illness. Um, so, I mean, I think, um, including your, your spouse as much as necessary, what, you know, whether that's bringing them to the doctor's appointments and um, really helping them understand 
uh, what you're going through. I know for me, it took me a long time to really figure out how to like exp- even realize the importance of expressing my feelings like explicitly. Sometimes I'm like, well, obviously it's hard. I don't have to say like anger or grief or anything like that. Like that's mm-hmm. just uncomfortable. Like that's just harder. <laughs> uh, and uh, yeah, you just really can't assume that your spouse is going to um, is going to understand or can't just pick up on everything. So um, yeah, I mean, there's probably so much, but those are a few things I think of first, but um, yeah, I I think you're missing one that I've heard from you a lot. (laughs) And that is just recognizing um, the good things and being grateful. Mm -hmm. And um, instead of thinking, oh, if only he were doing this, because I'm going through this. Instead, it's right. this selfless, appreciative approach where you're so thankful for him and how he stepped up despite everything else. Right. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, no, I'm glad that you said that because that is, <laughs> um, I mean, it is just so, so true that um, I want it uh, I wouldn't trade my illness. I wouldn't give it some to someone. I, you know, don't want someone else's life because I want my husband. I want my son. Um, I, you know, I want uh, my story and how, um, you know, God's used such pain to bring me to this purpose to help other people. And, um, you know, I'm a, I'm a, uh, a Christian, I, you know, you heard I work, worked in ministry. So people pray for my healing. I pray for my healing, but sometimes I feel kind of hesitant of like, I don't think it's supposed to be this instantaneous healing for me that um, I know has happened for people before this miraculous in a moment, because I just am so, uh, can I just, just feel like I'm supposed to figure it out. Um, obviously not figure everything out, but figure myself out so that I can help other people. Um, so yeah, there's so much good um, that can come from, from pain. Uh, and that's been such a key like message for me that from the beginning, I, I've realized that, um, you know, endurance is really important, but, uh, cause you know, if you're not enduring, you're like just giving up and that, I don't know, that's not good, but, um, what's so much more beautiful and better is to figure out how to embrace, um, embrace the pain and embrace the, um, the place that God's put you in, uh, in that moment, even if it's really hard and, um, and yeah, I don't know. Um, a lot of, a r- lot of really good and beautiful has come out of that, but yeah, that's kind of going off from, from marriage, but yes, like just find the the good in your marriage. And, um, if you're not able to, like, we used to go on hikes and things together, like, you know, we find the other things that we really love and enjoy and still, um, you know, it's like, you still, you still have each other. Like I'm not a, you know, my husband says that sometimes he's like, when people talk about things, sometimes he's like, you're, you're still like, I don't know, like you're still you, it's still great. So (laughs) just on a different adventure. Absolutely. Yep. Yeah. Kendall, I couldn't agree that I think the biggest key to your success, Mandy, in everything that you do, your relationship, your health, everything, being a mom is your positive attitude towards everything because <laughs> you're looking at there. There's always two ways to approach something. There's two lenses. And despite how difficult this is, you're always having a positive outlook and that positive outlook in, it ties back to your brain again, right? It's your, your faith and your mindset and your brain. So your faith and your beliefs and your Christianity, you know, teaches you and instills these values in you to be appreciative and grateful and then those behaviors, then I, I believe, and I think science has even proven, has a positive impact on your brain chemistry. And now you're interested in things like DNRS to further improve your brain chemistry because the brain can help reduce inflammation and can help strengthen the immune system. It's not saying the brain is the cause, but the brain can help overcome some of these hurdles by embracing pathways that induce healing rather than creating inflammation with neural pathways. And that really happens, right? right? So I really think it's this this whole approach from your your faith to your mindset to your brain, which then impacts your physical illness, which are all of your 21 plus infections, right? And I think that's the kind of stack I'm seeing here that you're building out for us. I mean, what, what, do, you, what do you think about that? Yeah, absolutely. No, I think, um, I, I don't know, it's, funny people ask me sometimes like how do you have hope and how do you 
I don't know, um, stay positive. And I just, I don't know. I just, I, <laughs> like, I just don't really know what to say. Cause, um, I, I even though it is really hard, I, I just do think that there is so much good that can come out of it. And like you said, I mean, like, um, I think my faith is a big part of that, that whenever I had to leave my job and it was that really emotional turning point, my husband and I, we just kind of looked at each other and we, um, just reminded each other of, um, Romans 8, 28, that God works all things together for the good of those who love him and are called according to, to his purpose. So, I mean, I just believe that all things, even hard things do work together. Um, and then that good can come out of it. So, um, yeah, mm -hmm. I mean, I don't really know what else to say. It's like, I agree. Yeah. Uh, but I know it's hard though, sometimes to, I know it can be really hard. Um, and I, like, I, I, I have had a friend before be like, Oh, do you get discouraged? It's like, Oh, I totally do. But I think, you know, you get, you have the discouraging moment. Like I told you last week, I had my little emotional breakdown day, just got it all out. But then, you know, you get it out and then you just like get up, wash your face and, you know, then look for the good and then start the next treatment or protocol or whatever. <laughs> mm -hmm. so. mm -hmm. So Mandy, walk us through the time period now. Jace is born. You're are you picking back up this bio? And what are you doing from the time Jace is born through the present? I think that was about a year ago, right? Or a little over a year ago. So walk us through what you're doing in your health and what other modalities you may be doing to treat For Lyme sure. and all the various co-infections and mold, et cetera, et cetera. Right. Yeah, I totally skipped over um cell core. It, when it comes to supplement companies, I'm a big cell core and does bio girl. And you know, I use others, but um, yeah, it's funny when Jace was first born, I have yeah, done like so many people, I've tried so many things. Uh, at first I, I was, um, using like electromedicine basically, and I'm not going to get into it a lot, but it was like, I putting, have questions. You know, <laughs> <laughs> uh, Later like, I have questions. <laughs> on my, on my wrist to like get it, like it <laughs> sending electrical frequencies into my bloodstream to act as like white blood cells. Um, I herxed a ton from that. It was certainly doing something. I was using PMF, cranial electrical stimulation. That completely got rid of chronic panic attacks. Um, Which one I was that? A device called the, I used a device called BioTuner. Um, the inventor, Bob Beck, he, he calls it Brain Tuner. Um, and I was having very chronic panic attacks. Um, and I discovered it while I was pregnant, started it like a week postpartum. And I mean, literally horrific chronic panic attacks went away within a couple weeks um, wow. and have been gone since. And my mental health postpartum was like the best it had really been in a while. So, so wow. that was a really awesome time. <laughs> um, but so, yeah, I was trying that. Then um, I discovered Cellcore and that was really game changing for me um, in my own health and as a practitioner to really um, kind of look at addressing things in a, in the right order, in a different order than I was. Um, some of that included really spending a lot more time on drainage pathways, mm -hmm. you know, opening up the detoxification pathways from opening the colon to supporting liver, gallbladder, kidneys, uh, lymph, um, et cetera. Then I, a parasite cleanse for the first time, uh, spent time on that. You know, I, I went through a lot of their kind of process using binders to help with detoxification or removing some of those chemicals and molds and things that we talked about. Um, and at, at that point I hadn't found Lyme yet. Again, I was kind of assuming it was there. And the plan was to kind of go through that process of really lowering toxicity, lowering parasite load, and then um, maybe like hitting it hard with herbals for Lyme at the end. Um, and I breastfed for so long that, um, I never felt comfortable with the herbals. And so I ended up adding in the homeopathy. Um, so yeah, postpartum, it was kind of my electromedicine phase <laughs> mm -hmm. to cell core and cell core. I do use a lot with, like, I do have kind of a, a group that I teach how to use cell core and, and we see so much, um, great results for, for that. A lot of really great with like, GI issues, especially. Um, mm. 
And then, and then, yeah, then I got into a lot of does bio. So, you know, I use so many things, but those are two of my, those, like those now I'm like, I, this is where I'm really seeing people actually see the needle move. Um, I don't think they're the only things at all. Um, but that's kind of where I've been, been hanging out with those two. And when, when you're doing those, um, like draining and getting rid of all the toxins and parasites and all of that, are you, are you going by, um, like, are, are you testing positive for something and then you do the cleanse and now it's negative or are you just going by how you feel or research or what, what is, is driving that? How do you know to keep going? Mm-hmm. How do you know when you're done? Right. That's a great question. So, um, when it comes to drainage, I mean, I think a lot of that is going to be based on symptoms. Um, and then I, you know, I think that a lot of these infections and toxicities do impact drainage. So it's kind of a constant process, uh, for me, like lymphatics is like majorly my, my weak area. And I do think that, um, that the infection load keeps me from being able to move lymph well. Um, like people use vibration plates and things. I can't tolerate one of those for a couple seconds. I'll have lots of herxing and symptoms. Uh, so there's certain things where it's like, you're going to, you're going to have to kind of maybe work on the infections to get the drainage moving. Um, uh, things like toxicity, you know, I do every so often a test to make sure my load does keep going down. Um, so many things, uh, at one point, like six months postpartum, we realized our house had become moldy. It wasn't. And then a leak happened. We didn't know about. And then at that point I was having neurological issues, um, balance issues. So severe. I had to walk around with a cane to not, um, to not fall over, feel like I was going to fall over. Um, so of course mold has kind of come up a lot in my journey. So, so that was definitely something we moved and, um, have really made sure I kind of keep getting that load down. Hmm. Um, parasites, I had done a stool test before it was negative. Didn't think Mm -hmm. I had parasites learn more. I'm like, okay. Um, all of us have parasites, but if we're chronically ill, I do think we probably have more of them because um, they really like the toxins, <laughs> the uh-huh. toxins, <laughs> ambiguous term, but you know, we talked about some specifics um, and they like, they like to eat mold. They like to eat Lyme bacteria. Um, and so I, I, you know, started an anti-parasitic protocol and I have now an album on my phone of over like I don't even know, 30 pictures or so of parasites. Um, so, so that's honestly, sometimes I tell people that's can be a way to test is just do an effective parasite protocol and see if something sure. comes out and not everyone sees things come out, but, um, the 30 yeah, from that, you, you oh, have- yeah, I've definitely over 30. And sometimes, you know, they're like small liver flukes and things. Sometimes mm-hmm, mm-hmm. they're longer, but yeah. Um, and wow. I don't take pictures of every single one either, but <laughs> yeah. I want to see them. <laughs> and some from other people too. Yeah. My, I've got my clients sending me pictures all the time. It's great, but <laughs> I'm so interested. So, yeah. I, I'm a nurse. And so I, you know, we like to get in there and see all the gross stuff. My husband won't let me talk about it at oh, the dinner table. <laughs> oh, yes. No, I've definitely learned my lesson there too. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of interesting to become kind of known a bit as the parasite person. And, and then sometimes <laughs> it does come up at dinner and you're like, probably shouldn't do this. But <laughs> yeah. Yeah, my <laughs> kids have stopped me recently going, mom, we're eating <laughs> like, Oh, right. right. Sorry. Sorry. Yeah. You forget. It's just, you know, kind of constantly in your mind. Yeah. Yeah. Kendall, did you have any questions about the electrotherapy? I think we we're talking about earlier. You said I have questions. I have questions. I want to make sure you got all of them, uh, got oh. all them out. I, oh, I, I've got a list of, of notes that I'm taking because so many <laughs> things that you're saying are just like, hitting these marks of just things we've been going through for myself, but also for my kids. And I have three kids and each one just has something Mm. totally different going on, but they overlap in a lot of ways too. And one of the things, you know, I don't know what everybody's beliefs are, but um, my stepsister had done like a cleanse of our home with, I think, Palo Santo Mm. and did, um, 
this pendulum thing and tried to clear everything out. And the one thing that was extremely stubborn was electromagnetic something Mm. energies or something. And, um, and that just keeps coming up. And so I got like this little crystal block thing and I threw it under my son's bed because he's having a lot of like right. pots and neurological symptoms. And I'm like, I don't know, I'm just grasping for anything, but I do feel like there is something um, electric and magnetic and like things just right. get pulled in. And I just, I, yeah, I feel like things just come to me or <laughs> cling to me and just trying to help like get it off. So. Right. Yeah. I would wonder if that, you know, if, if that, if that could be like a a high EMF environment, if that could be contributing Mm -hmm. to symptoms, that can be a tricky one for sure. Um, I haven't given up Wi-Fi or my, um, my house has a, I'm like, man, I just have had too many tough situations where, where someone's at the door. I'm like, I know that a smart doorbell is not the best for my health, but man, it just makes me feel more at peace. <laughs> but sometimes you make those sacrifices. Um, right. And, but, and how do you yeah. live in this world and have those conveniences? I mean, we we get to talk right now, like through our cell phones and like, what is that doing? But right. but everything, you know, you kind of weigh the risks and the benefits and, and is this important to me? Is it right. not? But sometimes when things are really great and fun, like my kids' tablets, it makes it really convenient for us. And then, uh, then you go, oh, it's fine. Look the other way. But then in hindsight, and like, do right. we really need all of these things? But right. then how much yeah. do you get rid of? Is, is it going to make a difference? Right. Yeah, I still use my iPhone, but I do have my ugly EMF blocking case that all the uh-huh. I'm sure all the Gen Z and Gen Alphas just think is so so, so fun. But <laughs> mm-hmm. but it helps me. I don't get tingly fingers. It protects me. So <laughs> yeah, so I you think- have noticed a difference just by having I that. I do. Yeah, my fingers. Yeah, even if I do just take it off, I know that listeners can't see, but if I do just take it off and hold it, my fingers start to kind of feel tingly and funny but tingly um, like gray nods tingly um I don't know that's a good question but that's really the only time it does feel that way so I don't know okay I I know I just feel like this is to me like the core message that we have where even when it comes to testing for Lyme disease, testing isn't perfect and we have to we have to sometimes make informed decisions based on our own observations we had mm-hmm. we had uh, Alex Hudson and Jody Hudson, who from the Alex Hudson Alex Hudson Foundation, she had really bad MCAS and really bad sensitivities to electromagnetic frequencies. And if she were near a router or a cell phone or you know, the, and they they would test this, her she would have crazy MCAS flares. And they did some genetic right. testing and found that you know people that are this extremely sensitive to EMFs or electromagnetic frequencies have different genetic predispositions or genetic differences that are making them more susceptible to these frequencies, right? So I think what you're, you know, Kendall, what you're saying and Mandy, what you just described is, hey, look, if we're noticing we're sensitive to every time I touch my cell phone, my hand gets tingly, that can't be a good thing. So you know what, maybe Mm -hmm. I should find a way to minimize that or address that. And Mm -hmm. we, you know, instead of going and spending maybe $5,000 on a comprehensive set of genetic testing that may not be perfect, if we use our own, you know, our own evaluation and just, and be curious about what we're doing and what's happening in our Mm -hmm. day-to-day lives. We can make informed decisions to, to stop doing things or being around things that impact us personally, that may not impact other people in our homes. Right. So maybe Kendall, you're not as, as sensitive, but your son is right. Maybe Mandy, your husband isn't sensitive, but you are right. And those are the things we have to evaluate and make decisions on. So I think that's a really core theme throughout your discussion too, Mandy, that you're really just kind of, you're going through every day and you're making, you know, informed decisions, you're trying things and you're constantly improving what you're doing to cater to your personal and, and you know, bio-individual needs for your body. And I think that's that's really mm-hmm. the biggest takeaway I'm hearing from, from your discussion here, right? Right. Yeah. That's been especially in pregnancy since I've been way more sensitive. I've, I've become very, very sound sensitive. That's been something new for me. Mm-hmm. I'm now a big fan of like earplugs really helps me get through social 
social situations. And that kind of connected me to some of the mast cell things. I'm like, that actually is a very common mast cell symptom is that uh, the sensory sensitivity too. But yeah, it's like every day it's like, oh yeah, I did. I definitely am reacting to that yogurt. It's like, okay, maybe I'll do a little less or I'll, you know, it's tough again being pregnant. I'm like, I need more calories for this baby. But I'm like, oh yeah, I know that I probably should stop the coffee that did cause heart palpitation. And then, oh, when I took the the potassium five minutes later, the heart palpitations like totally calm down. So yeah, right now yeah. more than ever, I feel like every day I'm in that kind of fine tuning things just because it has been a, a different period of time for me. But, but yeah, I mean, that is, I think for anybody struggling with Lyme or chronic illness, you really do have to learn to become, um, you know, your own best doctor or kind of a, mm-hmm. a detective of your own health mm-hmm. because um, your practitioner isn't going to be able to, to tell, you know, know those things and notice all those things that you, right. um, you, so yeah, every day is a, um, a, I don't know. A hunt. And like you said, focusing on the positive, I'm like, I, I mean, I think I'm also just blessed that I do just kind of I don't like the suffering and the symptoms, but I kind of find it fun too. <laughs> I do like experimenting. Yeah. You're a curious person. I am. I, I agree. <laughs> it's, it's, a, yeah. it's a weird thing to even say, but I I, I do agree. So mm-hmm. maybe right. is there anything else that you did throughout the last year or six months from where we left off that has been helpful in your journey that you haven't shared with us already? Yeah, I'm just curious because we want to know all the things you did that were successful that we can share with our listeners as tips to help them on their Lyme journey. Right. Oh man. Well, I got to try amp coil for like a week or two before I got pregnant. <laughs> so I was like, Oh, sorry. have to send this back. They were letting me test it out, which was super fun there for a minute, but what is um, it? Amp coil? Amp coil. I'm sure that you've heard of this. Are yeah. you familiar with amp coil? Yes. yes. Um, but yeah, it uses like PEMF and, um, I guess like frequency, um, I probably shouldn't say medicine frequencies to help, um, kind of, um, uh, again, again, it's tough to use probably the best language that they would want you to use, but bring things (laughs) back to a healthy frequency. So, um, yeah, I mean, it was really powerful. Some of the, you know, you put this kind of PEMF device on you and, um, really, I mean, the first, the first session I did was like a nervous system calming session. And after that, um, I was astounded that I had never felt that relaxed. I feel like in my life, I'm like, have I just never been in the parasympathetic rest or digest um, place truly? But, but yeah, like I, I, that's kind of a quick note because that was a very short period of time. But um, yeah, really, like when I work with clients now, um, so much of my approach is support mitochondria, open drainage pathways, um, bring in some support where we need, whether hormones are a big issue or we need to calm mast cells a little bit, or they're really anxious. We want to bring in support there. Then, I mean, I, I always start working on toxicity. Um, and then I either usually start, um, addressing parasites or I start bringing in support for infections through homeopathy. Um, and, and so I'm going to ask you some specific questions. As a follow-up, Mandy, because now now we're kind of where we are, right? So you are now, throughout all of this, you've continued to just persevere. You're you're a mom, you're a wife, you're doing all kinds of stuff. You you know, you're 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 doing as much as you can, but you also become a functional, as I said earlier in the beginning, when we started, you're a functional nutritional therapy practitioner, you're a certified dietary supplement professional, and you're a certified Lyme specialist. So you now help clients pretty much all over the world, virtually, I believe, right? So you're virtually assisting people all over the world. And I know a lot of people listening are going to have specific things that come with Lyme. And I'm going to address some common ones and ask you to tell us specific tools that we can add to our tool belt that we may or may not have tried already to help with specific things. So you just touched on mm-hmm. anxiety. So what are some specific right. things that you would recommend if if if, uh, if we had, you know, like a call-in, if this were a radio show, and somebody called in and said, hey, Mandy, I'm really struggling with anxiety in my Lyme experience. What do you recommend to help overcome this crippling anxiety? What would just be a, a general observation you'd make for things that have helped you and your clients dealing with anxiety? For sure. Yeah, if someone had anxiety as extreme as I did, obviously, there's such a spectrum 
spectrum. Um, I, I've seen the cranial electrical stimulation, that device to use BioTuner. I mean, truly, like it really did change my life. Um, that was a true, like in my, in my marriage, we talked about that a bit. Um, that was probably my panic attacks is one of the most difficult things on our marriage because it was just, you know, I often be yeah. multi hours. I feel like I'm, I'm dying. I don't know how to communicate. My husband doesn't know how to support me. Uh, and I don't know how to tell him what I need. So and that can be very, very difficult. Um, but, but yeah, that, um, I've, I've gotten to share that device with people. I'm not affiliated at all with them, but, um, that's been something, a tool that's been really helpful. Um, other than that, I do find homeopathy, um, often combination remedies be really helpful for, um, and sometimes single remedies too, in classical homeopathy. Um, I see it really helpful for emotional, um, emotional things. Um, obviously, you know, I think that there's, there's a lot you can do, but if I'm going to just give you one or two, um, that's often what I would give to a client. Um, I like this bio's anxious remedy. So that bio tuner, I think someone might see some, some good, good progress. <laughs> All right. So my second question for you is going to be, what if somebody called and another one is the just that the mast cell, you know, I'm very mast cell. I have the yeah. MCAS, right? That is extremely common in our Lyme community. So if that were the next caller and they said to you, hey, Mandy, right. I can't get this MCAS under control. I'm trying my diet. I'm doing the best I can. Sometimes I eat inflammatory foods. You know, I try to reduce my stress, but I'm human. I have a life. I have to work a little mm -hmm. bit and I have this stress. Mm -hmm. I, I can't do any more than I already am. What can I do to help with this MCAS and this inflammation? Because it's really, really, you know, messing up my life. What would you recommend to, the, to that person? Right. Yes, I think that addressing the nervous system when it comes to mast cell is, is very, very crucial. Um, because, you know, if you are, if your brain is basically stuck in, in simple terms, stuck in that fight or flight, seeing everything as a threat, you know, your, your, your body is going to keep interpreting most everything as a threat. Um, so I have seen programs like the primal trust and DNRS be very helpful. Um, as well as I, I mentioned briefly that I've been starting neurofeedback. I'm pretty, um, pretty, um, early on in the process, but, um, I do know I hear from other practitioners that that can be really helpful, um, for stabilizing people with MC, um, MCAS, uh, then, yeah, I mean, I, I'm learning so much about this right now since I've been in it. It's interesting. I've supported clients with some of those symptoms and I'm like, man, I'm realizing it takes much more than I realize, but I think you've got to figure out the triggers. And you said this person's probably, um, avoiding them, working on diet, you've got to stabilize mast cells, um, you know, keep histamine low as you can. And I really do believe that high infection load, often Lyme and co-infections, um, is, you know, tipping that person, uh, their immune system so far. And this is kind of a little bit nerdy science-y um, into a very 2-HT um, dominant state. So just like, I mean, that very allergy, his, the histamine allergy side of the immune system. And I really believe that getting the pathogen load down can help get them back into balance and kind of um, get the TH1 uh, back up. And that can really um, you know, that the, they help someone not be so reactive. Uh, so yeah, I think that's really important to consider that it's not just going to be, um, with chronic complex illness, it's never just avoiding food. You have to actually, mm -hmm. um, actually address the root cause, like remove what's interfering. The root cause is not just not eating a, the right diet. Um, for sure. And we've had, you know, the, the infections, I know we've been talking about a lot of, a lot of the natural stuff, but the infections themselves, I mean, look, Lyme has been proven to destroy parts of our immune defense. They obliterate lymph nodes. They decrease, right. you know, a lot of immune cells. They alter the way your immune system responds. And a lot of scientists are still studying this phenomenon, right? We've had people on this podcast that say, we're still trying to figure out why Lyme impacts the immune system the way it does. It right. changes the way your body responds to, you know, to, to everything. So you have Lyme disease, the pathogen, your immune system now is not responding the same way. And therefore it's not addressing other pathogens it can do on its own. So we come into contact with things every single day of our life. And whether it's viruses, whether it's just, you know, being out and about, you know, at a store or at work, or just, you know, in contact with family members. 
And our immune system is going to remove that virus from our body if we're coming into contact with the virus. But when we come into contact with Lyme, many of us have altered immune systems, mm -hmm. which make it harder for us to fight that virus mm -hmm. off. So I think mm -hmm. that's that's a big piece of it. So the more we can get that Lyme pathogenic load down and the co-infections, the better off we can be to rebuild our immune system with the support of all these supplements and homeopathy and herbs and lifestyle changes and brain retraining right. and all these things we're discussing, <laughs> right? So- I think that's that's great. And before I, I'm, Candle, do you have any questions you want to ask? I have so many, but I want to make sure you uh, you you know you get yours in too. <laughs> I mean, I I have lots of questions as far as um. Oh well, my gosh, I don't even know where to start. But um, with MCA, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Are you do you ever find individuals with uh MCAS that that aren't testing with like high histamine levels? Like, how do you? Or, or do they always show high histamine? Yeah, that's a good question. Because I've been um, as sick as I am, you know, I, I don't work with a large number of one-on-one -on -one clients. I have, you know, a number that I work with and then um, do a, a bit more of like kind of um, like a group coaching kind of thing. It's pretty relaxed group coaching. Um, but, but I mean, it's been a really cool blessing to help a lot of people while I'm working through my own issues. So I don't really know the answer to that question. I'm not, um, mm -hmm. haven't like been testing people's histamine levels at this point, but yeah, I do know that with MCAS, I mean, there's all kinds of inflammatory markers involved beyond mm -hmm. just histamine. So, um, mm -hmm. yeah, and no, I think that that's a great question and something, something I'm thinking about too, like what all is involved here and it, like it to bring someone to more, to better stability it's, it definitely is more than just, you know, taking an enzyme to break down histamine or right. just um, yeah. avoiding a little bit. Yeah. Um, and then it's tough. Like, I just, I don't like the, the super, super low histamine diets because it could just be so restrictive. So it's like, where, how do you help find the balance? But yeah, there's a lot there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's a good point. There's so many different um, facets to it. And I, I just, yeah, with my son, we all swear he's got it and two doctors are disagreeing yeah. and anybody who I know that has it is like, he has it. It's just not mm -hmm. showing up the way that they want it to show up. And we know that mm -hmm. Lyme disease does that too. So I was just, uh, yeah. just curious, but I mean, I think we just have to be the experts in ourselves, right? Like what you're saying and just try this and be tuned in and does it work? Does it not? Right. Yeah. I mean, I, a number of clients I'll tell them sometimes I find some people think they have mast cell and, um, and they don't have the obvious symptoms. I mean, years ago, I also did and went really, really low histamine and it didn't make any kind of difference at all. And I, you know, I tried so many very restrictive diets in hopes that it would help me and it wasn't the right thing. Cause I was just trying things on my own, but now this time I'm like, yep, no, this is helping. This, this is mm -hmm. it. Um, so I'm losing my train of thought a little bit there. Um, you also spoke about exactly. order to do things in the right, right order as well. And so I wonder how much that plays a role Absolutely. and why it didn't work before, but now it does. Right. So yes, what I was going to say was for some people, I'll, you know, you should notice a difference, you know, if your symptoms are flared up and you take an antihistamine, you know, um, sometimes my son will get like, rosy cheeks. Like he recently he'll get a little rosy cheeks after like drinking orange juice, which can liberate histamine. I'm like, Oh, that's interesting. Like he's really healthy. doesn't have a lot of symptoms, but that's a bit of a histamine reaction. So I expect that if I give him some kind of like antihistamine, that it'll calm down. Um, and there was an instance where I, I did that, you know, that, that doesn't show mast cell, but that shows like, that was a, that was a histamine it symptom response. that yeah. it improved and did respond. So um, that yeah, goes back to just testing yourself. Um, yeah, just experimenting. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, that's, that can be really hard, but, um, can be way more accurate than testing at times, but. Well, and, yeah. and hard with, hard with kids because I can yes. experiment all I want on myself, but when it comes to my kids, I'm like, show me the research. Like we've all got to be sure because I, I feel like I've got nothing to lose, but they've got a right. lot of years left and I want to do it right. And, um, you know, I've thought about, do I pump my son with antibiotics? Well, no, because he's so young. I don't want him to have that, you know, resistance at this age. 
So I'm willing to risk it because I'm much older and it's okay. But, uh, you know, you just kind of think of things differently when it comes to our children. For sure. Absolutely. So I have a quick question for you, Mandy. Well, uh, my final question actually is, you know, <laughs> one of the things that I can say, and I can, I'll pick on myself here, you know, as we start to make progress and we start to recover, a lot of things that we couldn't do before, those fears still remain. So for example, mm. hey, I want to go hop on a train and go spend a day walking around, I don't know, some some area, right? Well, I couldn't do that when I was really sick. And you think about it, you go, oh, I still can't do that. And you go, well, may, wait a second, I can, right? So the hard thing is evaluating as you continue to make progress and you're still not you know, back to a place that you, we describe as quote unquote fully functional, how do we evaluate right. and how do you how do you personally and how do you guide your 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 clients to evaluate what is a valid fear versus an irrational fear right because mm -hmm. in my own experience mm -hmm. i've had so many fears that have not served me well because i've delayed doing things out of fear way too long when in reality you know a year or two earlier i was able to do those things but it was just a fear that i had from when i was far sicker if that makes sense yeah right Oh, yeah, it definitely does. It's a good question. I, I feel like I um maybe, you know, if we ever talk again, I can maybe give more insight because I feel like, you know, I keep, I'm like, I keep getting so close to um seeing some of that breakthrough for me, like the, the, it is the physical um exhaustion, the like, exertion and tolerance, basically the fatigue that has been lots of things have fluctuated, but that's been the one that's been really difficult to budge for me. Um, and, you know, I think, I think I just am still in cell danger response and people will know that term just, um, cause the infections are just still, um, my body's just fighting that more than anything. More than You would love Kathleen right King and Primal Trust. She talks about that in her whole podcast, yes. the cell danger response. I'm sorry, but you, you really need to talk to her because it's you and I'm you sure can help I a ton will. of people. So I, yeah, please talk to Kathleen. Yeah, one of my closest friends, we met through the internet, um, through chronic illness. She's in Florida. I'm in Oklahoma. We talk all the time. She's she's talked like she's raving about primal trust all the time lately. So I totally need to um look into it and listen to her. So um, so I have not quite <laughs> even gotten to that point yet where um I have had to um kind of step into some of those fears. Now I think there are plenty of other fears. I've had to step into, and I kind of mentioned this earlier, this is like a new one for me. It's realizing that uh, it can be an empowering step in my healing of, you know, embracing and trying to live the fullest life that I can is actually like taking advantage of disability aids, <laughs> like the cane, the uh, wheelchair mm -hmm. and not being, you know, earplugs or whatever that, that one's not as Apparently a lot of people use those. I'm realizing <laughs> like a lot of us are dysregulated actually, but, um, but that, that was honestly as, you know, having to do that was, um, uh, you know, having to kind of let go of some of that fear. I think with foods, that's one that I've definitely experienced. Um, like I mentioned, I have done low lectin, I've done low histamine, I've done keto and that did not go well for me. I did paleo for a very long time. I was very paleo girl. Now, now who even knows what I am now? I'm gluten-free. <laughs> I'm, I like, I, I don't know, paleo ish, but also some grains depending on what they are. Um, a little bit West a price, but also not like a little bit of rape peat, but also not anyway. Uh, you know, whole low foods, FODMAP, but Low FODMAP, oh yeah, I've done all that. And you, you know, now it's like, I'm figuring out things in this pregnancy period of like what, what to do, but there, that can be a really difficult place with food is um, having, you know, having fear there. Um, and, you know, it, I, I'm not afraid of relapsing, but there like can be so much um, little bits of fear or stress about um, just social outings and gatherings and will I be able to make it through um, and, um, how much am I going to pay for this? Or will I be able to do the thing I'm scheduled to do tomorrow? Um, and yeah, I mean, the mm -hmm. best advice I probably have for that, um, is to, I mean, take it one day at a time and know that, um, you know, worrying about it doesn't, it doesn't make it better. <laughs> uh, and, um, 
you know, we've talked a lot about experimenting and trying and keeping, to, you know, you keep pushing forward and keep having hope. And um, I think even when you're starting to see progress and you're well, or you're figuring things out, you just, um, I don't know, you, like even, I'm sure even when you're like way more fully functional, you're still kind of, um, you're still kind of in that process in a way of there is the potential to relapse or um, yeah. for something to happen. But, um, you know, I, I, I kind of talk about sometimes some of my, like my worst fear when I was young was, um, you know, pro probably, you know, one of my worst fears, but really uh, was probably like getting sick. Like I've, I've been uh, and, you know, my worst fear happened has been happening and as we've talked about there's still so much good I, I wouldn't um I'm thankful for my illness because of what's come from it and I'm really looking forward to being better oh my goodness absolutely um but but even you know even if it doesn't work out the the right thing will work out basically mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, even if it's not what you want you just kind of keep you just kind of keep working it out. So uh, hopefully that makes sense, but that's kind of, mm -hmm. that's kind of what, what, how I processed through your question just now, but no, and it's a good one. <laughs> that was beautiful. And we've had you for over two hours now. So I'm going to end it with that beautiful ending. And I just want to thank again, Kendall, for coming back to co-host on the Think Bootcamp podcast. And Mandy, you taught us so much. You've given me hope yes. and inspiration. So thank you both so much for coming and joining us on the Think Bootcamp podcast.